Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd, first off, I'd like to thank Bioconference Live for giving me the opportunity uh, to present at the Clinical Diagnostics and Research Symposium. Uh, my name is Anthony Murata, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Augrex. And this morning, my talk uh, will be How does the soluble mechanistic biomarker 14C3 ADA assist in the management of rheumatoid arthritis? Here are my disclosures. And here are the learning objectives uh, for my uh, talk this morning. Firstly, it'll be to understand how markers are used in the management of rheumatoid arthritis and what the current unmet needs are with, with the need for new markers. And then also to understand how the two 14-3-8 biomarkers assist with the management of RA. Before I go into the talk, uh, I, I'd like to say that if there are any questions, please feel free to ask your questions throughout the, the talk using the question and answer key over on the very left-hand panel. Uh, I'll basically take questions throughout the talk, but address them at, at the end of the talk. And if uh, I don't have an opportunity to uh, address your questions, I've provided my email address at, at the end of the talk, and please feel free to correspond with me by email, and I'll do my best to address your questions with, within an adequate amount of time. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease where the immune system goes awry and, and the normal defense mechanisms become dysregulated such that they begin attacking the joints. The disease itself affects approximately 4.5 million people worldwide, and it has a female preponderance. If you actually look you know, at uh, the distribution, there's it, the, the uh, Diagnosis of RA is predominantly female-driven, with the ratio being three to one female to male. And the important thing is that within approximately five years following diagnosis, approximately 30 to 50 percent of patients uh, end up not being able to work. And so when we look at the economic burden of the disease overall, it's quite costly to the system. So there's a real impetus to identify your markers that can assist clinicians in diagnosing the disease very early on. Now, when we look at the pathogenesis of RA, it's a heterogeneous disease, meaning that there's a myriad of different factors that, that drive and perpetuate the disease. And importantly, the pathogenesis, not unlike cancer, can differ amongst different rheumatoid arthritis patients. And similarly to what we see in cancer, as the disease evolves, the pathogenic processes begin to differentiate. So drivers can actually, you know, the drivers can actually change between early and established disease, such that in early disease, certain pathways are more intimately involved in the pathogenic pr process. And then over, as the disease progresses, other factors or pathways will come in that continue to perpetuate the disease. And if you look at uh, this particular review by Ian McInnes in the New England Journal of Medicine, they're saying that there, there's a number of environmental as well as sociological and physiological factors that basically contribute to the disease, such as smoking, prior infections. Uh, there's also some recent evidence that uh, there's a connection between the neuroendocrine system that ultimately converge and break tolerance at, at the level of the immune system. And when tolerance is lost, it ends up culminating in synovitis or inflammation and the perpetuation of joint damage. And there's much more obviously to be learned about the pathogenesis, but significant, significant advancements have been made over the last 10 to 15 years. Now, when you look at the consequences of RA, you know, when we think of rheumatoid arthritis, most people will think of rheumatoid arthritis as a joint-related disease. And typically, the patient experiences pain and certainly disformity with deformity within the joints. And if you look at the image on the right-hand side, looking at, you know, where the arrows are, you can clearly see uh, inflammation within the joints as well as, you know, deformity appearing. And, and you can also see the presence uh, surrounding the joint of actual nodules or RA nodules as they describe them. But RA is not just a joint-related disease. It is now becoming more apparent that RA is more of a systemic disease as well. Patients who basically have RA are more at risk of cardiovascular disease as well as pulmonary dysfunction. And overall, when you look at uh, you know the lifespan of RA patients, it's well established that they have a reduced life ex expectancy between 10 to 15 years, less than the average individual. 
But when we think of the importance of diagnosis, if we can catch a patient early enough, there is now evidence that you can actually put the patient into drug-free remission. But the important factor there is that it needs to be caught early. And this is where markers like 14 through 3 can really enhance clinicians in diagnosing the disease early, such that we can uh, put the disease or, or treat it more effectively and possibly put it into full-blown drug-free remission. Now, when you look at what the current unmet needs are within RA, uh, there's a lot of recent research showing that markers can actually be present before a patient develops RA. So can we actually predict RA? And if you can predict it, is it possible to prevent it? And I think this is where the field is going. You know, similarly with that, there's also a need to be able to efficiently diagnose a disease very early on. And for this, we need new markers. So if you look at the current serological measurements, like rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP, it's well established that 30 to 40 percent of all RA patients have what we refer to as normal serology. So that means that they're negative for rheumatoid factor and for anti-CCP. So a lot of patients do, who are not positive may not basically be, be treated or may not be referred in an adequate time to a rheumatologist. So hence, you know, we, we need new markers. And if you look, and I have another slide that speaks to this, you know, a, a lot of the new classification criteria, actually 40% of it rely on serologic measurements. So, so really, you know, there's a need for markers that complement current diagnostic markers so that we can better diagnose the disease. And then similarly with that as well, we need to be able to predict who's more likely to have more severe disease. So within cancer, they can stage the disease. Well, within RA, it becomes very difficult to stage the disease at baseline to delineate who's more at risk of developing radiographic damage. And those are the patients that you want to identify and arguably treat more aggressively because you want to prevent radiographic damage. And then similarly, you know, with uh, what, what's happening in oncology, with the ever-expanding armamentarium of new therapies within the RA space, there's a need to essentially personalize treatment at the patient level. So we need to be able to have markers that can identify which drug to put a patient on and then to delineate whether the patient is actually benefiting from being treated with that particular drug. You know, and with markers, we'll then be able to tailor, you know, specific doses or delineate if a patient is not responding that they may need to go to an alternative class of therapy to have an appreciable benefit. And this is where, you know, 14 to 3 can uh, assist with this. And this is the direction that we've been taking with all of our development programs. Now, I'll just go into the discovery of 14-3 and arthritis. So the initial discovery of 14-3 ADA and arthritis was made back in 2007 by Kalani et al. And, and the data is published in the journal of rheumatology and the reference uh, is there provided for you on the lower left-hand side. Now, one of the things that uh, you know th this group did when they first published the paper was that they looked at the expression of the different family members of 14-3 by Western blot in synovial fluid and serum, and then they use the keratinocyte lysate as their positive control. And uh, what, what the group found was that the 1433 eta and gamma appeared to be the more relevant isoforms that they could detect by Western block. What they also noted was that the levels by Western block of eta and gamma were significantly higher in patients with different arthritis than in, when you compared it to healthy controls. And importantly, they also showed in this particular paper that the levels of 14 through 3 eta and gamma were five times higher in synovial fluid than in serum, indicating that 14 through 3 likely is coming from the joint space itself. And one of the other things that they were able to delineate within this paper was that the levels of 14 through 3 eta were significantly higher. Uh, than the corresponding 14 through 3 gamma. So 14 through 3 eta levels were consistently higher than 14 through 3 gamma. Now, with this, you know, I think it's important to understand before I, you know, move through the data, what are the 14 through 3 proteins? Uh, the 14 through 3 proteins are ubiquitously expressed intracellular chaperones. So I, I would coin them being very similar to the heat shock family uh, of proteins. Uh, the proteins, the 14 through 3 proteins themselves, were discovered as brain proteins uh, approximately 50, year, 50 years ago. And this is interesting because, 
there's a lot of evidence now that there might be a neuroendocrine component to to RA. So this might actually be a link between you know the neuroendocrine system and RA. And these are some of the things that we will continue on with our research to uncover. Now the 14th three proteins were named based on their chromatic graphic elution properties. And as I previously indicated, there are seven different isoforms that share approximately 50% amino acid homology. And if you look across species, they're highly conserved. Uh, and when we think of RA, the relevant isoform here is 14-3 eta. And so the, the rest of the talk will center or focus on 14-3 eta. So when, when we look structurally at 14-3, the 14-3 exists either as a monomer or as a dimer in vivo. And the picture here that we're showing represents the dimeric state of 14-3 atom. So you can see in blue, that's dimer one, and in pink, uh, the second dimer is noted there. And when the two 14-3 monomers come together, they actually dimerize to form the groove. And it's through the groove that 14-3 is able to interact with the plethora of different binding partners and regulate uh, a series of biologic processes. Now, just very quickly, jumping back to uh, some seminal data from the uh, Kalani paper, what, what they also observed was that when they looked at the levels of 14-3-3 eta and uh, compare it to MMP1 and MMP3, both looking within synovial fluid and serum, they actually found a very strong correlation between the levels of 14-3 eta and the levels of MMP1 and MMP3. And this precipitated the idea that 14 through 3 might contribute to the pathogenesis of RA by actually inducing factors that are intimately involved in joint damage. And to that effect, we've actually recently in the AL published data in arthritis research and therapy just approximately a month ago, showing that whether you're looking at early disease or established disease, uh, that the levels are significantly higher in patients who have erosive disease. So when we're looking at the image there, you can see no versus yes. So no, the no group means that they have no erosive data or damage, whereas the yes group means that they do have erosive damage. And what you can see there is that in the patients who have erosive disease, whether we're looking at early RA or established RA, the levels of 14-3-3 are significantly higher. So therein lies the fact that 14 through 3 might perpetuate processes that drive not only inflammation, but arguably joint damage. And to that effect, uh, we've actually started to look at what 14 through 3 does as a soluble ligand. And I think this schematic here is quite uh, important uh, in understanding why 14 through 3 is such an important factor within RA. So over on the left-hand side of the image, if the gray bar represents the cell membrane, then everything below the, the gray bar would be the intracellular side of the cell, with everything above being the extracellular side. So now, as I had mentioned in the beginning, 14 through 3 proteins, and specifically 14 through 3 eta, they reside as intracellular signaling molecules. And, and on the inside of the cell, they actually, through that groove, bind to a, a number of factors and regulate processes such as the cell cycle, uh, as well as the apoptosis and, and differentiation. And within the diagram, I've also shown that uh, a connection between the glucocorticoid receptor. And that's important because one, going back to you know, the whole neuroendocrine you know, connection, glucocorticoids are essentially an, uh, an anti-inflammatory break, you know, if you will. And 14 to 3 on the inside of the cell has a very important function in that it binds to the glucocorticoid receptor and stabilizes it from being degraded by the proteasome. And through that stabilization of the glucocorticoid receptor, the endogenous glucocorticoid can bind to the receptor and then engage or elicit its anti-inflammatory effect. Now, if we move over to the right-hand side of the panel, What's happening in RA is that 14 to 3 is actually being liberated outside the cell. And, you know, the question ha that has been posed to us, well, is it coming out of the cell nonspecifically or is it as a consequence of necrosis or damage? And importantly, we have data to show that actually 14 to 3 is present in very early stages of RA, even prior to the uh, development of erosive disease or before it's actually present 
by, by imaging, visibly present by imaging. So we believe that 14 to 3 is being triggered by some sort of mechanism that causes it to be released outside the cell as an early warning signal. And when 14 to 3 exists outside the cell, what we've been able to show is that it engages specific cell surface receptors that culminate to drive or activate various signaling cascades. And I think importantly, you know, when you're doing in vitro mechanistic studies, it's very important to use a clinically relevant concentration of whatever ligand that you're using. And, you know, having a biomarker where we can actually measure the serum levels of 14 to 3 has afforded us the opportunity to design very good mechanistic studies where we're using concentrations of 14 to 3 as a ligand that are reflective of what we see within patients. And so when we stimulate cells with 14 to 3, and, and we've looked at a myriad of different cells, what we're seeing is that it's activating, you know, certain pathways like the MAP kinase pathway, specifically ERK, as well as junk, but not P38, which is kind of unique compared to other uh, and uh, intercellular or extracellular ligands, as well as intercellular ligands. We're also seeing that it activates AKT, which is a very important pro-survival and metabolic pathway. And then it's also activating the JAK-STAT pathway. And, and for those of you with an inf inflammatory background, you know that the JAK-STAT pathway is such a key you know, factor w in terms of driving inflammation. Uh, what we're not seeing is that it's actually activating NF-kappa B, which again differentiates it uh, amongst other ligands. So when these signals culminate at the level of the nucleus, what we're seeing is that 14 through 3 can induce not only inflammatory factors, which are well established at perpetuating disease such as IL-6, uh, IL-8, and TNF-alpha, but it also upregulates factors that are intimately involved in joint turnover. So we're seeing that it upregulates MMPs as well as rank ligand. And so the MMPs are very critical in cartilage turnover, whereas rank ligand, as many of you know, uh, play a very critical role in, in bone resorption. So we think that 14 to 3 is actually driving disease. Now, when we first embarked on our uh, development programs around 14 to 3, we had a single marker. And through our research, we've actually identified three other markers that are intimately related to 14 to 3. Now, because 14 to 3 is not present extracellularly, the body actually itself recognizes that 14 to 3 as being foreign. So it mounts an immune response to it. We've also been able to show that 14 to 3 in RA patients is citrinolated and that there's citrinolated 14 to 3 at the level of the protein, but there's also circulating autoantibodies that preferentially recognize the citrinolated form of 14 through 3. And so as we continue on with our development programs, we will begin to assess how the four markers move together to inform disease. And that brings me to this slide, because that's a very critical slide for us. So on the very left-hand side, the talk that I'm giving today will focus on the 14 through 3 protein and the 14 to 3 autoantibodies on the lower left-hand side. We've actually, as I said, you know, been looking at the citrinolated versions of 14 to 3, and we've made significant strides on that, and we're actually hoping to present some of the data around the citrinolated autoantibodies at uh, the upcoming ACR meeting in, uh, in October um, at the end of this year. So, so for the purposes of today's talk, I'm just going to focus on the protein as well as the autoantibodies. And within the image, you can also see within the middle there, uh, the, a silhouette of a, a man or of a human. And so we, we actually believe that 14 to 3, because it drives up some of these uh, other factors that, in fact, 14 to 3 should be targeted with the view of trying to to clear it from uh, circulation. So we've actually now embarked on a therapeutic program and are advancing uh, our drug development programs in collaboration with the National Research Council of Canada. And we hope to make significant strides over the next 18 months in advancing that. And we have some very novel strategies at how to develop novel biologic therapies to eliminate 14 to 3 you know, from circulation using a, a mechanism that would mimic what we see occurring at the patient level. So moving along now, when, when we started our programs, you know, we had the view of, well, our markers need to essentially not only be useful for diagnosis, but we need to evaluate what kind of prognostic information they provide as well as therapy response. And more recently now as well, over on the very left-hand side in the red, we're beginning 
we are beginning now to look at, for instance, the utility of the 14 TT markers in screening individuals who are at risk of developing RA to see, for instance, if the markers can predict who's likely to develop RA. And so the view from a development standpoint is to look at each marker on their own in isolation to see how they inform particular clinical outcomes, but then to begin to combine the different markers together to see how they work together in concert to inform, you know, these very, you know, different uh, factors that are important or different facets that are important from, from a clinical standpoint. So I'm going to talk now about RA diagnosis. So we've spent a significant amount of our time over the last few years really looking at how the 14 through 3 markers on their own aid in the diagnosis, but together with current measures, how do they complement measures like rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP in improving the diagnosis of RA? And I think this is important to, to look at. So these are the recent, uh, the 2010 you know, classification criteria. And I think the important thing here is that 40% of you know, the overall score is ascribed to, to markers, whether it be uh, serological markers like CRP uh, or the acute phase reactants, pardon me, like CRP or markers like ACPA and RF. Clinicians are becoming more and more reliant on the use of serology to aid in the diagnosis. And if you look at the uh, right-hand side of the slide, you can see that uh, from this particular study that approximately 30 to 40 percent of patients have normal serology. So there's a real need or impetus for new markers that can assist clinicians in better managing and diagnosing the disease. So this is, you know, what we've been spending, as I said, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our existence on. How do the 14 to 3 markers complement current measures to assist clinicians? And so, you know, I, I want to highlight a few important papers that really show the need for new markers that can assist clinicians in, in you know, essentially diagnosing the disease much early on and what the impact of that is. So, you know, you, you can see from these three, you know, critical studies that there's really a window of opportunity, you know, to treat RA. And it's becoming very apparent that, you know, a patient needs to be captured within the first six to 12 weeks following symptom onset to actually really, really provide an opportunity to put the drug into drug, or sorry, the disease into drug-free remission. You know, and, and there's consequences of, of a delay. You know, and more, and if you actually look at the literature, it says that a lot of patients are being referred approximately by year two and such by the time they actually end up seeing a rheumatologist you know the disease has already progressed so we need to educate you know clinicians at every level as well as scientists uh, that you know markers can really assist us in you know identifying the disease much earlier and that those patients who are seropositive even without clinical signs may need to be expedited you know for referral so that we can watch and see what happens with these patients. Not unlike what happens, for example, with prostate uh, cancer, or sorry, with prostatic disease, not cancer itself, where if a patient has a elevated titer of PSA, you know, they monitor those patients more closely. I'd say the same thing with NRA has to happen, where if you have a patient that is seropositive for a number of these diagnostic markers, you'd want to watch them a little more closely. And hopefully that's the direction that the field will move towards. So I think, you know, when working in the biomarker space, the most important thing that, you know, you need to assess at the outset is making sure that you have access to very well characterized clinical cohorts. And we've been afforded the a great opportunity to work with a number of collaborators, you know, across the world who have given us access to their very well characterized cohorts. And I think that's what allowed us as a group to make significant advancements over the last few years. And as you'll see, you know, with uh, one of our assets, the autoantibody asset, uh, the autoantibodies for to 14 to 3, having both early and established disease afforded us the opportunity to really discern how different these autoantibodies are, the 14 to 3 autoantibodies are compared to ACPA and RF. And, and I'll talk about that briefly as, as we move forward. So here's some data around the 14 through 3 protein as a diagnostic marker. And so the, here's a uh, scattered dot plot of uh, both established RA and early RA, uh, as well as a number of different disease controls. 
And so the very left hand side of the slide, the RA group where we're looking at 135 patients. That represents patients with established disease that were on a DMARD but were naive of a biologic. And then over on the very left, right hand side of the slide, we've looked at now 477 early RA patients and, and that represents the continuum of expression for 14 through 3 there. And then uh, again, we've looked at a number of different disease controls. And there will be a publication coming out through the Journal of Rheumatology within the next couple months that highlights the diagnostic utility of the 14 to 3 protein, where we've looked at uh, a, a quite a large number of different disease controls as well as healthy individuals. And we show that the marker is very, very specific for RA. And I think when you look at you know, the expression, you can clearly see that with whether it be established RA or early RA, that the 14 to 3 marker itself is much higher in RA compared to all other controls. And using a clinical cutoff of 0.19, the sensitivity uh, is around 77% and the specificity is 83%. And as the, you increase your cutoff thresholds, you can clearly see that the marker becomes more specific with a corresponding drop in sensitivity. And I think, you know, therein lies a, a critical question too that we as investigators need to look at, you know, with, with some of these uh, other disease controls that are positive for 14 through 3, are they a false positive or is it informing joint risk or risk of joint disease? As you know, a, a number of different uh, autoimmune diseases have RA as a comorbidity. And if you look at the frequency of positivity for 14 through 3, in you know the different disease controls that we've looked at, they're very much in line with what you would see RA being as a comorbidity rate. So part of our impetus as well from a research standpoint is to really truly investigate that. Are these disease controls who are positive for 14 through 3 actually patients who are at risk of developing RA as a comorbidity? And so these are some of the things, as I said, that we'll continue to do. But for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to talk about how the 14 to 3 protein and the autoantibodies combine to inform an RA diagnosis. And so moving, moving along now, here's some data that uh, we've presented uh, recently at uh, ACR last year that speaks to the specificity of the 14 to 3 autoantibodies. And I think importantly here, and this was a bit of a surprise to us when we were embarking on our development programs, if you look at established RA, uh, you, you can clearly see that the expression levels of established RA are very comparable to what you would see within healthy you know, individuals as well as OA and when, when you lump all controls together, you know, there doesn't appear to be a difference between established RA versus all controls. But if you look at the early RA group, you can clearly see that these autoantibodies are much higher in early disease. And, you know, that's a bit of a surprise, I think, you know, to a number of us who are working together on this program in that, you know, these autoantibodies seem to taper off as disease ensues. And the, these are these autoantibodies are vastly different than to markers like ACPA and RF, whose levels are stabilized throughout the disease. They're relatively ACPA and RF are relatively non-modifiable. So there's a unique phenomenon around the 14 to 3 autoantibodies that we need to continue to investigate. And we're actually running a study right now to look at uh, in a in a longitudinal cohort what happens in early disease to the autoantibodies at year from baseline to year one, and we're seeing that the levels do go down, which is quite interesting. But uh, again, th that's stuff that will come through and hopefully we'll be able to present that at the upcoming ACR meeting. But importantly, when we look at the specificity of the 14 to 3 autoantibodies for early disease, we can clearly see that they're very specific you know, for early disease. At a cutoff of 380 units per ml, we're seeing sensitivity for early disease around 77% and specificity at 93%. So these autoantibodies do a very good job of discriminating early disease from not only healthy individuals, but all controls. Now, you know, thinking about the two markers together, you know, the protein together with the autoantibodies, you know, we started to deter, delineate or address how do these markers combine to inform an RA diagnosis? And I think when we look at this particular slide here, you know, this is the subset of the uh, overall number of early RA patients that we've looked at. So here we're looking at 254 early RA patients. And we provided the positivity rates for 1433, the protein, ACPA, 
you know, as well as RF. And you can clearly see when you look at the first blue bar that runs across there that when you look at ACP and RF, the positivity rate for those two markers in this particular cohort were around 75%. Now, if you look at just the two 14 to 3 markers, the protein and the autoantibodies, those two markers together identify 91% of the early RA population. And then if you look at the, the use of all four markers together, or any one of the four markers together, they're capturing 95% of the patient early RA patient population, which is very important. If we can actually capture that many, that much more patients, then we stand a better chance of basically treating the disease more aggressively, especially in the earliest stages of it. And you know, we're seeing this consistently throughout. Now, I think this is a very important slide as well, you know, in that it begins to speak to what's happening between early and established disease with the 14 through 3 markers. So within early disease, you know, we're seeing that you know, they're almost equally prevalent in terms of the positivity rates, whether we're looking at the 1433, you know, protein or the autoantibodies. And this obviously is not a longitudinal study. This is a cross-sectional study where we've just looked at early disease and established disease and looked at the positivity rates. But I think it, it highlights something very important in that when you look at the protein, positivity for the protein increases as these disease progresses. Whereas when you look at the autoantibodies, they're much more prevalent, as I said, in early disease, but there's a very small percentage of patients with established disease who are positive for the 14 through 3 autoantibodies. And in looking at the literature, this is not a unique phenomenon you know, to RA. I've seen other indications in other dis autoimmune diseases like diabetes, for example, where certain autoantibodies are much more prevalent in early disease and as, and as the disease progresses, the autoantibody levels begin to drop off. And so it raises the question, well, what are these autoantibodies doing? And are they potentially protective? And so these are some of the things as we advance our therapeutic strategies that we're going to look at. You know, what differentiates autoantibodies, you know, in, in different patients who have better, you know, clinical outcomes. And, you know, looking at that, I, I think this is a very interesting finding here. So this is data from a early RA patient cohort where we've followed these patients over five years and the patients were grouped according to whether they were positive for 1433 and or the autoantibodies. So when you look at the patients and they're stratified based on the baseline positivity and then we basically looked at their radiographic outcomes over the course of five years. So the total SHARP score is reflective of the joint damage score. And so when we group patients uh, according to whether they're only positive for the autoantibodies at baseline, or if they're positive for both the protein and the autoantibodies at baseline, when you look at their radiographic outcomes over the five years, it seems that the patients who are only autoantibody positive have a lower radiographic traje trajectory over the five years compared to those patients that are not able to adequately deal with the burden of the 14 through 3 protein. They progress more aggressively. So, so that actually it, it begins to precipitate, you know, our thinking, are these autoantibodies actually protective? And, you know, when you look at it, what what's the difference between the autoantibody profiles in those patients that are only positive for the autoantibody compared to the patients that are double positive? And why is it? that uh, there's a tolerogenic break in that the protein or the burden of the protein increases. And, you know, truly if the protein is driving up some of these, you know, pathological processes or factors, then it kind of makes sense that, you know, with higher levels, we would expect to see that, you know, patients who have higher 14 to 3 levels, that they would actually have more severe outcomes and not do as well clinically. And so these are some of the things as well, again, at the upcoming ULAR, uh, in June that we're going to be presenting, and we're excited by that. You know, and, and you know, I think this kind of is an important, uh, you know, slide going back to this slide. You know, well, you know, the, clearly the patients who are 14 to 3 positive for the protein progress more than the ones that are just positive for the antibodies. And, you know, that's important overall because when you look at, you uh, current serological markers and their ability to predict who's going to go on to develop radiographic damage. Current markers, 
uh, essentially can only predict 32% of the total variance in radiographic outcomes. So there's still 68% of the whole equation that needs to be addressed. And so there's a real need or impetus to identify new markers that can aid or augment the current markers and better predicting th this particular outcome. And so this is one of the things that we're excited to explore you know, as part of uh, our research programs to see how 14 to 3 combines to predict radiographic outcomes. And we've already shown uh, previously at ACR that uh, 14 to 3, the protein itself, is a predictor of radiographic damage at year 5 as well as at year 3. So there, there'll be continued work, you know, in, in this regard as well. Now, you know, one other, you know, thing that is obviously important in, in the field is the need to personalize, med you know, the treatment itself at, at the patient level. As I was saying, the disease is very heterogeneous, and there's a number of new therapies that are coming onto the market. And doctors need to have the ability to discern who to treat and how to treat them meaning what drug do you basically you know put a patient on and we've seen significant advancements obviously w within the oncology space where a biomarker aligned with a therapy can actually improve outcomes and i think this is the direction that you know the ra field is moving along and you know because it's a chronic disease it's also very costly and so there's reimbursement hurdles you know that uh, drug companies you know face and regulators want to have markers that uh, can assist in in safety and toxicity profiling as well. So overall, the field is advancing quite quite aggressively. And I'd say within the next five years, there's going to be some really exciting advancements within the treatment paradigm as well. Not to say that what's been done already is not exciting, but I think as markers, you know, or the importance of markers comes to the forefront, clin um, pharmaceutical companies aligned with clinicians and companies like ourselves will really work at towards personalizing the treatment at the patient level. And so what can the 14 to 3 markers do in, in terms of therapy response? And so I'm just presenting some data here around the 14 to 3 autoantibodies and protein in a small study that we've done looking at TNF response. And this is in an established RA cohort. So if you remember back on the pre, one of the previous slides here where I've shown that uh, essentially only 11% of those patients with established disease are positive for the autoantibodies. What's unique or different, you know, about these patients? And so when you look at those patients that are autoantibody positive, uh, you can see that at week 15, those patients that are autoantibody positive achieve a lower DAS at week 15. So DAS, for those of you who are not in the RA space, is reflective of a disease activity score or disease severity. So patients who are autoantibody positive end up achieving a lower DAS. And if you actually look at the change in DAS at 15 weeks, you can clearly see as well that the patients who are positive for the autoantibodies have a better change in DAS. So overall, and, and in running regression analyses, we can clearly see that the 14 to 3 autoantibodies inform or mark uh, response. And so therein lies, you know, that the 14 to 3 autoantibodies confer a beneficial effect and mark a greater likelihood of response to TNF therapy. And then when you augment that or parallel that with the protein, what is the protein doing? What we're seeing here is that if you look at patients at baseline, uh, who achieve a good ULA response versus an inadequate response, what you can see is that the baseline levels of 14.33 are significantly lower to begin with in patients who achieve a good response. And if we go back to the mechanism of action slide, that kind of makes sense because what we've seen you know, from our in vitro work is as you increase the dose of 14.33, that you're stimulating cells with, we see that it actually has a greater effect on the output of cytokines. So lower levels of 14.33 arguably are better because they may not be increasing the, you know, the cytokine sink. And as the levels of 14.33 increase, perhaps what's happening is that 14.33 is driving up some of these inflammatory factors, which might be one of the explanations why the patients who do not achieve a good response are not actually achieving it because 14 to 3 is driving up, you know, these inflammatory factors. You know, paralleling that, when you look post-treatment at 14 to 3 over there on the right-hand side of the slide, when you look at patients who achieve a good ULAR response, what we're seeing is that the levels of 14 to 3 are modifiable with therapy. 
which again is unique amongst markers like RF and anti-CCP that are not typically modifiable with therapy. You know, we're seeing that 14 to 3 can be modifiable with as little as four weeks of treatment. So in this particular study, you know, we're looking at 12, an average of 12 weeks, and what we're seeing is that a change in 14 to 3 correlates very strongly with the change in normal serologic measurements that are used to assess, you know, disease activities. So whether it be a change in ESR, you know, a change in CRP and a change in DAS. And, and when you look at the change, the relationship between, you know, the change in 14 to 3 and the change in ESR and, and the p-value, that's very strong. So this is not occurring by chance. The decrease in 14 to 3 obviously, you know, may mark or inform who is actually achieving, you know, a, a therapeutic benefit. And these are some of the things, again, as part of our R&D programs that we're going to continue to advance, not only looking specifically, you know, at TNF, but also uh, across different classes of therapy. So we are presenting data at the upcoming ULAR meeting in Paris, where we show that 14 to 3 not only informs response to DMARDs, but also that it informs response to tocilizumab or the NTIL-6. And the unique phenomena across all three classes of therapy is that if you begin with lower levels of 14 to 3 at baseline, you actually have a better outcome. And so that kind of solidifies the fact that 14 to 3 might be a mechanistic factor perpetuating, you know, inflammation as well as joint damage factors. And that targeting it may be a, a benefit. And so we're very excited at, at Augrex to begin our therapeutic development programs. So that brings me to almost the end of the talk. And so I thought it'd be relevant to highlight what the key conclusions are of the talk. So one, we've shown you know, that 14 to three is a mechanistic marker that may play a role in the pathogenesis of RA. And for that, I would encourage you to look at our recent publication uh, that's just out in arthritis research and therapy with the lead author being Walter Maximovich. We've shown that the measurement of the 14 to 3 markers, the protein together with the autoantibodies, are useful as are specific and useful as RA diagnostic tools, and that they combine very well with ACPA and RF to improve the diagnosis and to bring it towards you know almost the point that no patient is being missed at 95% of the early RA patients being captured. We've also shown that 14 to 3 positive patients I, for the protein have worse radiographic outcomes. And that if you begin with lower levels of the 14 to 3 protein and are positive for the autoantibodies, you're more likely to respond to anti TNFs. And so, with that, uh, I think it's kind of useful to talk about what makes 14 to 3 novel amongst the other markers that are currently being investigated with, within the RA space. Number one, 14 to 3 is highly specific and it's joint derived. If you remember from the beginning from the Kalani paper, you know, they showed that the levels of 14 to 3 were five times higher in synovial fluid than in serum, highlighting the fact that 14 to 3 may be a joint derived protein. You know, 14 to 3 itself, as we move, uh, you know, clockwise uh, around the image here, it's a single biomarker panel. And, and together, you know, we're starting to see that the marker you know, together as a panel can inform not only diagnosis, but other aspects that are important to clinicians, whether it be prognosis or therapy response. We've also begin to, you know, show that 14 to 3 drives disease. And as we uh, work through our therapeutic development programs, hopefully we'll be able to show that targeting 14 to 3 provides a clinical benefit. We've been able to show in this presentation that in 14 to 3, the markers inform the entire disease continuum, whether it be diagnosis, prognosis, or therapy response. And I've started to, you know, discuss, for instance, that the levels do change with, you know, therapy and response, and that 14 to 3 may have use as a monitoring tool for, for therapy response. And as I said, we'll begin to work more and more aggressively on this with a number of different investigators. And then the other aspect is, well, you know, and, and I touched upon this when I started talking about, uh, you know, the uh, sen sensitivity and specificity of the 14 to 3 protein and the potential positivity or the opportunity in disease controls to identify patients who have autoimmune disease who might be at risk. You know, so can 14 3 3 predict who's likely to develop RA? You know, prior to they uh, essentially develop the disease, and can it be a marker in autoimmune you know patients? 
to highlight patients who are at risk of developing the disease, you know, as a comorbidity. And to that effect, I, I want to uh, point out some data that we presented at uh, last year's ACR meeting as a late-breaking poster. So this is data uh, in a cohort of uh, arthralgia patients. So these patients were either seropositive for RF or ACPA. They did not meet classification criteria, but they had some joint complications. And so they were brought into this study. We looked at 148 of these individuals. They were followed uh, for over five years. And at year five, the collaborator, Durkheim von Schardenberg, knew who developed RA versus who didn't. And you can see at baseline, when you look at uh, you know the 14-3 expression, the levels of 14-3-3 are significantly higher in the patients that go on to develop RA than in the patients that do not develop RA. And when you look at 14-3 as a predictor of RA development, you can see over on the right-hand side that 14-3, when combined with other serologic or clinical measurements, can augment those and improve essentially the prediction model. So with that. You know, and we're going to continue to expand, you know, our research endeavors in that regard to see, for instance, how well 14 to 3 can, and the different markers can serve to inform or predict RA. You know, so if we can predict RA, can we actually prevent it? And I think this is where the field is actually going, and I'm very excited to be part of that and working with a number of investigators within the rheumatology space to address what 14 to 3 may offer in terms of predicting disease. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, as I said, uh, I, I will begin to address questions that have been posted uh, you know, through the forum. Uh, if I don't get an opportunity to address your question, please feel free to email me at amarat.augrax.com and I will do my best uh, to address your questions adequately in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. So now uh, I'll look at uh, the, the questions. That, that are coming in uh, and uh, essentially read them out to you and, and, and address those. So it seems that uh, there's a couple questions that have come in that talk about how does 14 to 3 perform as compared to the marker CCP. Uh, and so there, uh, if I just basically go back to, you know, that particular one of the slides, um, bear with me for one sec because I'm going to find the slide here that uh, speaks to that. We presented that early on. And I believe it was this slide right here. So if you look at this early RA cohort that we've looked at, in this particular study, we're seeing the positivity rates being 61 in, for 14 through 3 and 67 for ACPA. But I, I think, you know, therein lies the question. It's not about how it compares to uh, anti-CCP, it's how do they combine basically, you know, to inform the disease. And if you look at, you know, together, you can clearly see that 1433 augments uh, essentially ACPA and improves the diagnostic capture rate. And the earlier, so a question again has come in in regard to this, how was the early RA cohort de defined? And so the early RA cohort was defined by having disease less than three months of symptom on, or uh, less than three months of disease duration. Uh, I'll, I'll see if there was uh, any other questions. So I think that that was, uh, are there any other questions? Because I believe that uh, that uh, those were the only the only questions that uh, have, have come in. Just bear with me. I'm trying to familiarize myself uh, with the system. Yeah, so that, that was, oh, I, I'm seeing more questions pop up. I think, uh, sorry, they're continuing to come in. Is there an, so one of the questions that has come up, is there an inverse correlation between the reduction of autoantibodies and increase in TNF serum? Uh, you know what, that's a very good question. Um, actually, we I don't have the answer to that just yet. Uh, when we look at the correlation of 14 through 3 together with the autoantibodies, we don't see a very strong correlation there, but uh, you know we, we will begin to look at that because I'm actually about to embark on a study with a group of investigators in the U.S. where they actually have data 
looking at cytokine arrays. And so one of the markers that they've measured is TNF alpha. So we'll be able to, to address that. And I'm happy, you know, to provide that to you, uh, you know, as we develop the data. And feel free to email me directly you know, in that regard. So, so another question has come in, what value would autoantibodies add in the diagnosis compared to the 14 to 3 protein? So I think if we look at slide 22, you know, when you look at the autoantibodies, or actually I'll jump back, sorry, to slide 21. When you look at, uh, you know, that particular question there, if you look at the autoantibodies on their own, uh, the capture rate is around 77%. Well, when you use the two markers together, the autoantibodies in the protein, you can clearly see, so if you look at the green text, uh, second row from the bottom, the two markers together identify 91% of the early RA uh, patient population. So, so together, the two markers can really capture a significant proportion uh, of, you know, the early RA patient population. So they're complementary in that regard. Uh, another question has come in, is there animal model study uh, on the function of 14 to 3 ADA? Uh, we are beginning to look at that. People have done knockout studies, but unfortunately, because there's high homology amongst the different isoforms, there's a compensation of function, you know, for 14 to 3. So some of our work will begin to look at how when 14 to 3 is present extracellularly, you know, in the joint space, you know, within these, you know, uh, RA models, you know, what does it do? And we've actually started to work with uh, BioSeq, and they have a number of human model systems that are primed uh, with, with different ligands. And so what we've done with them is we've actually combined 14 to 3 in a milieu of other factors to see if there's a synergistic and additive effect. And when we do that, we can clearly see that by adding 14 to 3 in, you actually get an additive effect where it starts to induce, you know, cytokines in a more potent fashion. But, you know, we'll, as I said, you know, on the animal model side, we'll begin to, you know, truly assess this in greater detail. We do have some data that we're presenting at ULAR uh, in a uh, non-interventional longitudinal study in animals where we show that uh, the marker, the biomarker dynamics differ in animals who develop mild disease versus, uh, you know, more severe disease. And obviously because of, um, you know, the requirements of you, you are not to disclose this at this particular point. Uh, if you want, feel free to get in touch with me post ULAR, which is June, uh, at the end of June 15th, and I'd be happy to walk through that data with you. Uh, another question has come in now, is the assay commercially available? And the answer to that is yes. The assay is available through Quest Diagnostics in the U.S. Uh, if you actually go to their website and type in 14 through 3 ADA, Quest has 14 through 3 as a standalone product because of its utility in terms of therapy monitoring and because it's modifiable. And then they also have it as a diagnostic panel called Identra, where they've combined it with uh, 1433 RF and CCP, you know, to be used for, for diagnosis. And I think they have some, you know, very interesting, uh, you know, data that shows the complementarity, you know, of the three markers together in, in terms of identifying RA. And Stan Nades, I believe, is writing that up right now. So another question has come in, is citronellated 14 to 3 present in early RA? What is the ratio of uncitronellated versus citronellated? Yeah, you know, those are, that's another great question. The protein is citronellated. And when you look at the autoantibody profiles of citronellated 14 to 3, both in early and established disease, the positivity rates are very comparable compared to what we see in established disease for the autoantibodies. And they're, so the autoantibodies are vastly different. So, you know, because we're detecting citronellated autoantibodies, one would infer then that the protein itself is citronellated. Uh, in terms of dis delineating uncitronellated versus citronellated, the challenge therein lies where we need to essentially develop an antibody that can discriminate between citronelline and arginine. And so we've actually successfully been able to achieve this where we've developed a pan-reactive citronellated autoanti or a citronellated antibody that can discriminate between citronelline and arginine irregardless of flanking amino acids. And right now we're in the midst of scaling that antibody up. And once we have reasonable quantities of that, then we're going to look at the burden of citronellation 
in relationship to the total pro amount of protein. And with that too, as part of our R&D programs, we want to look at how citrullinated 14 to 3 as a ligand behaves in comparison, you know, arguably just to the non-citrullinated form because there's evidence that when the protein becomes citrullinated, that it actually behaves differently. And the certain ligands like IL-8, when it's citrullinated, it actually becomes more potent. So we need to discern that because as we start to think about or contemplate our therapeutic development programs, we might need to have a bit of a different strategy in terms of treatment when the protein is citrullinated versus not. Uh, so I think I'm just seeing um, Basically, I, I don't think that there's any other questions at this particular point. So hopefully if I've addressed you know, all of your questions. As I said, please feel free to follow up with additional questions via email. I, I'd be happy to take that. And I think with that, then I'm going to thank everyone for their time this morning and wish you a wonderful day and, and a great weekend. Thank you very much.